Welcome. My name is Terrence McGuire, and I'm one of the instructors for the SANS FOR585 Advanced Smartphone Forensic class. And today, we're going to talk about third party applications. You can see my contact information is located in the slide. So if you have further questions, feel free to reach out to me, and I'll get back to you when I can. So here's the challenge. Regardless of your type of smartphone, there are millions of apps that you can download and install on the device, which all have different types of functionality that can be important in any investigation. The problem is the mobile device forensic tools are not going to be able to decode all of this data. So you as the examiner are going to have to have an understanding of how these third party applications store that data so that you can do a more thorough investigation when you are looking at these apps. So first, where is the data stored on the device? In this slide, we're looking at the file system on an iOS device. So this would be the internal storage of that device. And what you're gonna find is this application data is gonna be stored in multiple locations. So you can see that the application is going to have its own directory, as well as it's going to have shared directories on the file system as well. And depending on the permissions for that application, it may store data in other locations of the file system. So the key here is during the class, we'll talk about and we'll provide kind of cheat sheets on where you can find the data. Also, we'll emphasize being able to do things like keyword searching so that you can find different locations to where this application data is being stored. Also, it's being stored in multiple formats. As you can see, an iOS device may use plist files or like most smartphones, there could be SQLite databases holding the information. And we're going to talk a little bit more about SQLite databases further in the slides. If I have an Android device or a BlackBerry, I may have external storage as well. So don't forget about your SD cards. Application data, some of that application data is going to be stored there as well. The other nice thing to keep in mind in an investigation is even if you're locked out of the handset, the device itself, and don't have access to the internal storage, you can always still pull the SD card and acquire that data to get some of the information. And then, like most modern smartphones, data is also being stored in a cloud. So this data is not actually on the handset, but is in a cloud resource. The challenge here is, do you have the ability to access this data? And do you have legal authority to get the data, even if you have the tool sets to be able to pull this information down from the cloud. And we'll talk about in the class some of these challenges and show you some methods to be able to get this information. So how is the data stored on the device? Well, for most smartphones, you're gonna find this information in a SQLite database. What you're gonna see is these SQLite databases are just made up of tables that have columns and rows of information. And some of the information may be located in multiple tables as you look at the data. In this slide, we're looking at the active data from an external .db from an Android phone that's actually giving us some information about what's being stored on the SD card. The key here is right now we're only looking at active data. We'll talk about, and you can see in the screenshot, some of these tools are able to recover deleted data, which some of the SQLite viewers aren't going to show. In the class, we spend a lot of time looking at SQLite databases. I mean, that's where the data is actually stored. You'll even run SQL queries in the class. We have two different labs to where you write your own query to pull specific, re specific relevant data from these devices as it relates to your investigation. 
when we're dealing with SQL 8 databases, the main database isn't the only file of interest. SQL 8 does store information in what we'll call these temporary files, these rollback journals or these write ahead logs. What's important here is these temporary structures contain either previous data or current data that's not written to the main database. As you'll see in the class, if you don't look at things like the write ahead logs, there could be information relevant to your investigation that's in the write ahead log that hasn't been committed to the main database. And the failure to examine some of these other files means you're going to miss some of the data itself. We talked before SQL 8 databases, they're a container. So they're going to have active information that you saw earlier, but they're also going to contain deleted information. And in this screenshot, we're looking at a table from a SQL 8 database in the hex editor, and we can see. This is from a chat application and we can see deleted messages. So we'll emphasize in the class looking for deleted data. And we'll also talk about using things like scripts that can automate this process and recover the deleted data from the SQL 8 database. If I just use kind of a SQL 8 viewer, I'm just going to see active data and I could miss the deleted data that's in the free blocks of the SQL 8 database. Also, kind of another challenge is, where is the app? It is possible, and I'll use Facebook and Dropbox as services that I can access through my smartphone by using my web browser. So you may not even see an application on the phone that relates to those services, but your user is accessing that through some web browser. And if you don't do full web browser forensics on the device, you're going to miss that information. And we'll certainly go over that during the course. If these topics are of an interest to you, you certainly would want to take one of the FOR 585 Advanced Smartphone Forensic Courses. Uh, coming up in 2019, we've got in January the course in Amsterdam. And then both in February and April, it's being, it's being offered three times in multiple locations live. Also, if you can't travel, you can certainly take the course online, like in New Orleans, where they're talking about a simulcast that allows you to virtually be in the classroom. And if that's not a possibility, you can always take the class on demand at your own time and effort. If you can't travel and work demands are too great, you can always take this course on demand. If you're interested in taking the class, you can see the link down below, the for585.com courses. And there's also a link for a blog, which will give you further information about the course and smartphone forensics. Hopefully, I see you in a class sometime soon. Have a good day. Welcome. My name is Terrence McGuire, and I'm one of the instructors for the SANS FOR 585 Advanced Smartphone Forensic Class. And today we're going to talk about encrypted iTunes backup files and how that might help you or be a challenge to you in a smartphone forensic investigation. So we usually get the question, how am I going to acquire a locked iDevice, right? So most iDevices now, if it's locked, to be able to acquire it, you have to have it in an unlocked state. There are some third-party vendors that can assist you with that, um, but there are limitations to that, and time and money. It, it costs money to, to use Celebrate services, or there's gray key that's out there, but of course that is only available if you're in law enforcement. So you may not have that option available to you. And what we would advise is try to locate a backup of that device if you can't get into the handset. Think outside the box here. Don't always just get focused on the handset itself. Where might, those, where might you find an iTunes backup? Well, 
usually on a local computer system, whether it's a Mac or a Windows desktop or laptop. You may find backups that are created with iTunes. And now you could also find backups in the cloud. Again, that cloud's going to present somewhat of a challenge to where you're going to have to be able to get access to it and have legal authority to access the backup files themselves. Another challenge you're going to find with these backup files is they may be encrypted by the user. So you may have an encrypted backup that doesn't give you access to the data. Kind of the silver lining to that or the good news is if you're dealing with an encrypted backup, it actually contains more information. Apple will allow things like the keychain, which would be the passwords, Wi-Fi, web browsing, and health data can only be stored in an encrypted backup. So in a way, if you're dealing with an encrypted backup, you have more data. How are you going to get into this encrypted backup? Well, there's a couple different options. One is Hashcat. The nice thing about Hashcat, it is a free open source tool that will allow you to try to crack this encrypted iTunes backup. It's cross-platform, so it works on Windows, Linux, and Mac. And it supports multiple hash types, not just iTunes backups that are encrypted. In the class, if you take FOR 585, the Advanced Smartphone Forensic class, we will use open source tools in the class as well as paid commercial tools. So, uh, for example, during this lab, you'll also use the Elkomsoft Phone Breaker. So you'll get to see how that works as well. That is not a free open source tool, and I won't be addressing that today. But just as a reminder, the, the class is tool independent, meaning we use commercial tools as well as free open source tools when we're teaching the course. So here is the minimal options or parameters that you're going to need for Hashcat. So we'll address a few of these to, to show you how that works. So I'm running Hashcat. I have to pass it a hash type. So that's that dash M option. So the 14,800 tells Hashcat that it's dealing with an encrypted iTunes backup uh, 10 or above. I then have to pass it that option of attack mode. In this example, the attack mode is zero, which is telling Hashcat I'm going to use a dictionary attack. I then have to give it the hash file.txt. And, and the reason that that sort of has that asterisk next to it is I can't just give it the manifest plist. You're going to see that the manifest plist in an encrypted iTunes backup holds the key the encryption key, but I have to get some of those parameters out, uh, put it in a set format so that Hashcat is able to crack that. And that's probably where most people make their mistake is they just try to pass the manifest P list to Hashcat, uh, and that will fail. You're going to see that in, in the next slide, the parameters that we need. And then my last option there is the dictionary that I'm going to use to try to crack this encrypted iTunes backup. Where do I find these iTunes backup files? So here's showing you the path. Actually, this is uh, these are mine on the, I, I store my iTunes backup on an iMac. Uh, but remember, they can also be stored on a on a PC as well. So you're usually going to look for that mobile sync and then that backup folder. And what you'll see is then you'll see another folder contained in that backup folder. Each one of those are going to have a unique GUID, that unique device identifier, and that's going to be specific to the iDevice itself. So you'd be able to associate that unique GUID value, that unique device identifier, back to the iDevice that the backup was created from. And then as I dig further into that folder structure, you're going to see a series, besides the backup files, you're going to see a series of plist files that contain information about the backup that was created. Um, and we will go into each one of those in the course itself. 
Uh, but right now we're just emphasizing the manifest P list. And what you're actually looking at in this slide is the manifest P list sort of in a hex editor. And you are viewing not only the encryption key, but also the salts and the iterations that are all part of this encryption process. And it's these values that Hashcat needs to be able to crack the password. So again, I just can't pass it the manifest P list. I have to extract these values out of the manifest P list to be able to give that to Hashcat. Now we all know uh, those that are in digital forensics, we know you like dealing with data in a hex editor, uh, but there is a script for that. So what you're looking at in the next slide, and I've got to give a sort of a shout out to Phil's MD. He is the author of this script. He is also one of the folks that are involved with Hashcat. Um, that is the URL to the site to be able to pull down his script. But he's got a Perl script that he, you can just run against the manifest P list and it's going to pull those values out for you. So it makes life a lot easier. And that's what I've done here in this slide. I've taken his script, I've run it against the manifest P list, and then just created what I called iTunes backup password.txt. And then that's what you're looking at in this next slide. Once the script runs, it pulls out those values, which is going to be the encryption key, it's going to be the salt and the iterations, and then it puts it in a format that Hashcat can then recognize. And then this is the file that I'm going to then pass to Hashcat in that earlier slide that Hashcat will be able to crack. And that's what you're looking at here. I didn't do a live demo, but you're looking at the end result. I am now running Hashcat. I'm passing the mode, the parameters for the type of the attack against that iTunes backup password.txt. And then I've got a dictionary attack that I'm running against the encrypted backup. And you can see uh, in this setup, it took about a minute, 36 seconds for Hashcat to crack the password. Now, the password was Apple, all lowercase. It wasn't very advanced uh, to demonstrate for the, for the exercise. But by using Hashcat, I could now then take this encrypted iTunes backup load it into my forensic tool of choice to be able to parse the data. The tool is then going to ask me what the password is for decryption. I'd be able to give it that value and then be able to conduct an examination on this encrypted iTunes backup. If these concepts are of interest to you, you may want to think about taking FOR 585. What you're looking at in this slide is the upcoming courses in 2019, lots of different options. We have international locations, as you can see, at the beginning of the year, we're in Amsterdam. Later in the year, we're in London. We're in other locations across the United States. In February and April, three different locations. Also, if you can't travel, like where you have that asterisk next to New Orleans, that's a simulcast cat class, which means you can virtually be in the class from the comfort of your own home. And SANS also offers this on demand. That's sort of an asynchronous class to where you take it at your own time uh, for when you'd be able to complete the course. There's links down below to be able to sign up for the class, as well as the course blog, which could give you more information about advanced smartphone forensics. Appreciate your time. Hope to see you in a class soon. Thank you.